Okay, hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and uh, welcome to oops, welcome to uh, Facebook Live. And uh, I'm in my office, you can see behind me, and I have the lights down. I'm reading some cases, so it kind of looks like this really cool lighting I have, but uh, um, nothing very special. Took my mask off, shaved the other day. So I hope everybody's doing well. Um, it's kind of a crazy world as we all know. It looks like the numbers are a little bit better. It looks like uh, some of the work going on from some of the drug companies, Pfizer and uh, AstraZeneca is doing okay. So one can hope that we move forward through this craziness. Um, I, I was in New York visiting my kids last weekend. It is somewhat amazing. They live down by Battery Park and not far from the World Trade Center. And it's amazing that you drive to New York. There's no traffic at the Holland Tunnel or Verrazano Bridge. There's no people walking the streets. I mean, I was outside, mask and everything, uh, wiping and washing and everything like that. But um, it's amazing in New York, knowing the crowds of people, there's no tourists, there's no regular people, forget the tourists. The only people outside I saw walking were people walking their dogs. I would say about 80% of the people and 90% of the people were wearing masks. There always are some people who know better than everybody, but uh, what can I tell you? So, um, and I was at uh, with Whitney out there, and Ron, and Tori, and uh, and Tori, and Tori, and Sam and Max, and uh, so hello to Whitney from Camp Lunch. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure what they're having today. Maybe uh, pigs in a blanket or something like that, which are little hot dogs with wrappings. I'm sure you know that. Um, so today's talk is on trauma, and even this era of. Uh, of COVID, we still see trauma cases. We don't see as much trauma, perhaps in terms of MVAs. You know, one of the things that's worked out well for people, as there is less traffic on the road, there is less accidents, and as people are in no rush to get from A to B, and there's a lot less drinking because all the bars are closed, you see a lot less accidents. We still see uh, the usual stab wounds and gunshot wounds that doesn't seem to go away. Uh, but when we talk about abdominal trauma, we talk about a range of processes. So I thought I would cover some of the basic principles of trauma and go from there. So the first thing is we know that over the years, the first articles on trauma were from UCSF, uh, San Francisco General, Brooke Jeffrey and Mike Federley wrote a book on trauma with I think the surgeon's name was Trunky. They wrote a book 35 years ago before people were scanning, before people had scanners in the ER. Remember in the old days, no one had ER scanners. We took the ER patients over to the hospital and they would get scanned. Now there's not a, a center that doesn't have a scanner in the ER. Surely a trauma one center needs to have scanners in the ER, but almost every hospital has a scanner in the ER. And whether it's for trauma patients or acute abdomen patients, everybody has uh, scanners in the, uh, the ER setting. It's a very important volume for all of us in terms of patients. Uh, at Hopkins from 11 to 7, 11 p.m. to 7 a.m., we do all our patients in the ER, even the hospital patients. So the ER is very busy. It's a busy scanner. It's our top of the line and, in fact, our newest scanner. But let's talk about trauma. So if we're talking about abdominal trauma, so we won't talk about the chest trauma, though I'll mention it a little bit because many of our patients are MVAs or trauma where it could be chest or abdomen. Uh, if it's a stab wound, then you know it's a stab wound to the abdomen. You're not going to be doing a chest typically, but for MVAs, you'd be doing a chest and an abdomen. Some thoughts about protocols. We never use positive oral contrast unless you're worried about a leak. And then, for example, with a gunshot wound or a stab wound to the pelvis, and you're worried, for example, about injury to the bowel, you need to give rectal contrast. I know it's annoying, but you need to give rectal contrast. Okay, we'll come back to that. In terms of oral contrast, ideally the gift to give water for oral contrast material to distend the stomach, but often you don't have the time because many trauma cases hit the ER and then go right into the scanner. We always give IV contrast. I think doing a trauma scan without IV contrast, unless you were doing a trauma scan to look at someone's foot for a fracture, is not a good idea. Now the questions often become, should you do a non-contrast scan and then a contrast scan? Um, it's not worth the radiation. There's really nothing you're gonna see on the non-contrast, perhaps that's gonna really help you that you would have missed on the contrast scan. 
So now when we talk about giving IV contrast, let's say 90 to 120 cc's, four to five cc's a second, depending on the patient's size in terms of the volume. Now the question is what phase do you get or do you do multiple phases? Now there's been some recent articles and we've had this experience as well. When you're looking for active bleeding, when you're looking for vessel injury, when you're looking for the vascular map, you need to do arterial phase imaging. The most recent classification of splenic trauma where the importance of active bleeding uh, is noted requires you to do arterial phase imaging. Now, arterial phase imaging, what could be the downside? Well, we said the positive side is you look at the vessels, if there's vascular injury. If there's perfusion changes, you're gonna see them, some from a stab wound or a gunshot wound. But the, uh, the bleeding, the pseudoaneurysms and the like are gonna be best seen if you look at the patient's arterial map. Now, one of the things, of course, looking at perfusion Sometimes later phases may be helpful because the early phase, the perfusion changes may be there simply because of timing. Now we always need to be careful, remember that if a patient has a trauma, particularly significant trauma, uh, and they're hypotensive, that can cause all sorts of issues in terms of perfusion, that is late perfusion. One of the things we see on CT, you think about the hypoperfusion syndrome, right? Very bright adrenal glands, bright pancreas, enhancing bowel, uh, small IVC, the flat IVC sign. We talk about looking for blood as a sentinel sign where the bleeding is going on. In patients who are hypotensive, it is possible not to be able to see some of the injury because you're not having enough enhancement. So if you have a patient and you realize cardiac output is not where it needs to be, you, you will need to get a second phase. So just come back in 30 or 40 seconds later. Now, one thing, if we deal with trauma to involve the kidneys, let me make some special points there. You often wanna know is there contrast extravasation from the kidney, let's say it's a contusion or it's even a laceration, stab wound. You, can, you can't appreciate the presence of contrast extravasation unless you have excretory phase imaging. So in those situations, excretory phase imaging is going to be critical. Another thing speaking about the kidneys and ureters and bladders is the fact that if you have pelvic trauma, well, either a gunshot wound, stab wound, or just an MVA where you see symphysis or azotabular fractures, and you see pelvic hematoma, the question is, can you exclude bladder injury? If you wait for the bladder to fill from above, contrast being excreted, the bladder is not gonna be well distended, and you can miss up to 70% of bladder injuries. If you suspect a bladder injury based on the type of trauma you see, you wanna make certain the patient has a catheter in the bladder, which they should have for proper uh, uh, therapy. And then you drip 300 to 500 cc's of contrast. We put 50 cc's of contrast in a bag of 500 cc's of saline. So uh, we then drip that in under gravity. If the patient has a leaf in the bladder, you'll see it then. Again, waiting from above with an IV injection, you're gonna miss a significant proportion of the bladder injuries. When you do with a retrograde study, a CT cystogram, you're gonna see uh, every extravasation. You're gonna see whether it's intraperitoneal or extraperitoneal. You're gonna know what it is, where it is, and why it is. So that becomes very, very important. Sometimes, You'll scan the patient, there'll be pelvic fractures, fluid in the pelvis. You'll have to go back, put contrast in the bladder, and rescan the patient from, let's say, the crest down. You don't need to do the entire thing. But delayed scans are particularly critical. You're not going to really pick up those renal uh, contrast extravasations unless you have late phase imaging. Arterial and venous phase will not cover it. Now, maybe we should be doing delayed phase on all patients, and some people will do that we have them routinely depending on the type of injury. Now, one of the other things we need to be careful about is of course, uh, if you're only doing the abdomen because of the mode of trauma, make sure you look at the lower lung fields for pneumothoraces. Pneumothoraces are not gonna be uncommon. Maybe not from the primary injury, but also from the secondary features of just the fact the patient fell or had some other traumas going into it. So that indeed becomes very important. 
you want to make certain that you look at each organ. Brooke Jeffrey made the point, you gotta go through the liver and the spleen, the kidneys, the adrenals. You gotta look at the bowel. Is the bowel perfusion normal? What about the mesenteric vessels? Do you see the SMA? Do you see the celiac? Are the vessels patent a normal caliber? What about the renal arteries? What about the aorta itself and the iliac vessels? Is there vascular injury present? Uh, 3D mapping can become very valuable. We talk about 3D, particularly in closed chest trauma. We are worrying about a dissection, you're worrying about the root, the ductus region, but abdominal is just as good looking at the mesenteric vessels, SMA celiac, renal arteries, iliac vessels, and looking at the relationship of the vessels to the various organs. One of the things, which is no surprise, when you look at trauma, yes, we all look at the axial images, but then you need to routinely carefully look at the coronals and carefully look at the sagittals. One of the things that's been written about and we wanted to write about it years ago, <clears throat> but never got to it, is the fact that you will miss bony injuries <clears throat> unless you do sagittal views. Um, I think an article published said that 85% of L-spine fractures were missed if you only looked at the axial images. So you need to routinely look at the L-spine, look at the T-spine if you have it, look at the sacrum and exclude any injuries. Bony injuries are very important. Transverse process fractures are very easy to miss. Coronal views are particularly good at seeing them. So that becomes very important as well. I think one understanding about trauma, like with many things in CT, is the fact you need to look and sort of be a detective. Rule out bony injury, rule out soft tissue injury. Looking at the subcutaneous soft tissues for site of where the patient may have had trauma. If it's a stab wound, looking at the tracking across where the, the uh, the knife may have gone, or looking with bullets where the entry and exit wounds are, and whether there's any organ involvement. When we see blood in the abdomen, is there active bleeding? It can be difficult to see. There may be tamponade initially. You want to look at both arterial and venous phase imaging. Many of the bleeds are well seen arterially and venous, but some are not really seen on arterial. There may be slow bleeds, and they really are seen better on venous. So that can be very, very important. Now this is a good time if you have questions. So let me just say a few hellos. Uh, John Biacchino is across the street in Virag in our cancer center. And Whitney and the guys are at camp lunch. Uh, it's that time. Uh, and then there's party time. And then uh, Salida from Savannah and Roy and Carlos. Uh, we wish that we say hello to everybody. Hope everybody again is doing well. Uh, but if you have a question, uh, this is probably a good time to ask the question. Um, we do have on CTSS a number of different resources in trauma. There's a section in the teaching files that's called trauma, and it has abdominal trauma, musculoskeletal trauma, thoracic trauma, some neurotrauma. That's all there. It's worthwhile looking at. And we have a few lectures. I am working on some new lectures on trauma. In terms of what's new in terms of trauma, again, as I mentioned, there is some reclassification of splenic injury where you need arterial phase imaging looking for active bleeding. I think that the, the idea about detecting active bleeding as being more serious is a good finding, but again, it's pretty clear that if you wanna do active bleeding, you need to make certain you have arterial phase imaging. Venus can help as well, but the arterial phase probably is the more critical and may be the only time you, you do see things. Now, in terms of what pitfalls are there, I think the biggest challenge, of course, is some of the practical challenges. You wanna make sure the patient doesn't move, that the patient doesn't breathe during a study. Obviously, that's not always easy in a trauma patient, but the good news is scanners are faster, so for 10 seconds, you usually can get by. Things that I'm concerned about missing, a missing bowel injury. Bowel injury can be very hard, particularly when there's no distension and there's no contrast involved. So you wanna look very carefully, look for perfusion changes in terms of the bowel, particularly decreased enhancement. You wanna look for any high density fluid near bowel and perhaps the patient has had an injury. And again, bowel trauma, stab wounds, blunt trauma are all things you need to think about, but are very easy to miss. 
I mentioned the signs of patients being hypotensive. Very bright adrenal glands, not mass-like, but thin limbs, very bright. The flat IVC, the poor enhancement of the kidney or delayed cortical medullary differentiation persisting. In bowel, the, um, the bright bowel sign where the bowel enhances and very persistently enhances and that blush does not change. So we talk about all of those things. We talk about hypoperfusion syndrome uh, and the flat IVC is just a good example. I mean, maybe on one cut it looks flat, but then it looks good, that doesn't count. I'm talking about when the IVC is flat to the point it's like a little sliver. That is hypotensive. You need to tell the surgeon because they may see a bleed and they want to sit on it. When the patient's hypotensive, no one's sitting on anything. And it's a radiologist who may be the first person to recognize that. Now, Vigito asked about rectal contrast. If you have a gunshot wound to the pelvis or a stab wound, or the stab wound or gunshot wound is in the course of the colon, um, you would need to give rectal contrast to exclude colon injury. You, can, you know, sometimes you can't tell, you see a stab wound and there's air near the colon. Does that mean it's air near the colon or is there a perforation of the colon? There's a high morbidity, high mortality if you miss bowel injury. So simply you wanna give rectal contrast will we'll give again a, a low contrast solution of oral of omnipake and saline uh, just injected by the tube 500 to 1000 cc's that works pretty nicely gets all the way to the patient's right colon and if the patient does have a bowel injury you will see it remember um, oral omnipake is uh, not going to be problematic in terms of peritonitis it's inert, so if you have a bladder injury, if you have bladder injury or bowel injury and extravasates, you're not gonna have peritonitis. That's why the contrast agent is so safe. The biggest problem with rectal contrast is you have to do it, the patient may not be cooperative. Uh, the patient uh, is in pain, so that you know you can't you understand why they're not cooperative, and having them lay on their side, putting a rectal tube in, getting them to hold the contrast. You gotta use a balloon so they hold the contrast. Our techs are really good at it. We don't do it that often, but when you do it, it can be life-saving because you pick up injuries you only would have thought of. Now, if the surgeon was going in, perhaps it may not be so critical, but if you're gonna watch the patient conservatively, it indeed becomes very critical. Let's see what else on my uh, uh, comments. So there's uh, a you, Scott, hi you, and you use uh, many of our things, and um, he, he Thanks for finding time for the lectures, and we do appreciate the comments. And uh, I think one of the things with CT is us is Lily and Sarah working at home. I work from home sometimes, mainly at work. We are producing the content, the the new lectures, the new videos, the writing, the cases. So we are producing everything. So we are not uh, being overly affected by COVID. The biggest challenge for us, I think, for all of you, is the fact that you're not at work. Um, we come in, but I'm in my office. We're not roaming around. You're not stopping in the cafeteria, having a cup of coffee, or the little social chit chat, the things we meet people, get to know people. Um, we talk to friends. We just talk about patients, confidentially, of course. But where a lot of the consulting and a lot of the learning takes place is not there. There's no doubt that you can do reading from home. Most of my colleagues will say it's slower from home. But let's say you can get as fast from home, the monitors get better and you take better monitors home. The challenge still is teleradiology is a way of reading films. Teleradiology is not something that's good for education and it's not good for collaboration and it's not good for research. You can do some things. I give a lecture to the faculty and residents and fellows every Wednesday. A lecture on um, Zoom works very well. You can see the screen, you can interact, but in general, people like to be around people. Uh, even if you're a Larry David type person where you want that privacy. But I think it's a challenge. I think that, you know, you can't mentor someone you don't know if you don't see them. Picking up the phone is okay. I could talk to friends, but they have to be friends. If I don't know somebody, it's kind of like a very short, brief, rough conversation. Everyone's trying to come up with words. And it is a challenge. And I think one of the things that we talk about you know, education being harmed by COVID, whether it's you know, like my grandchildren, the pre-one, 
whether 1 to 8 or 9 to 12 or college, I think you also have to look at it in residence, in fellows, in medicine, and in radiology. The fellowship training, the doctor training, everything is under the gun and everything is being challenged. So we are looking for ways of doing things better. I think you can do a lot with things online, but you're never going to be the same. I think anyone who says it's the same or it's the new normal, I will be the first to tell you there's no such thing as a new normal. There is only one normal. This, you can make the best of it, which is what we all need to do and be safe, but that's not a new normal. That's just how it is. So we want to get back to normal. We're not looking to adjust to the new normal. We will do what's necessary to be successful the way things are. I think what you have to do, whether you're a radiologist, you're a technologist, whether you're a nurse, whether you're a patient, whether you're just a person, you need to be, be successful in every environment. And you need to go with the punches. It is what it is now. It's not something we prepared for, something we thought about, something we knew about. But you need to get by. But the flip is, we don't consider it a new normal. We're adjusting to difficult scenarios and making things happen. Some things will persist. A little more teleradiology may persist. But I think, and we're going to write an article about that, Steve Rowe, I'm going to chew myself, that one of the challenges of the teleradiology world is the rest of the stuff begins to slow down. Education and research begin to fail. So that's interesting, and maybe I'm controversial in saying that, but that's what we think. And I guess my time's up. So I gotta thank everybody for their attention. Hopefully we'll see you on CT as Us, and Facebook, and Instagram, and, every, and Twitter, and everywhere else we are. Again, if people have good ideas for topics for these talks, let me know. I'm happy to be flexible and talk about whatever you want. And if not, have a great week and see you soon.